everyone. All right, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. My name is Wintana Melikine. I am the Customer Solutions Manager here at Civic Eagle, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, and today we have a really robust panel discussion. We're going to be talking about how do you build powerful coalitions all the time, but also more specifically during the pandemic. And so we have two really brilliant leaders here from Minnesota that are gonna tell us a little bit about how they've been doing it, how they've been able to build strong coalitions and pass really uh, great policy that's been able to have a large impact on their communities. And so um, our first guest is Julia Freeman, who is with Voices of Racial Justice, an organization that has been near and dear to my heart. We also have Grace Waltz, who works for the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce. And if you know me as a former entrepreneur, so appreciate everything they do over there. And so um, what I'm going to actually do now is um, do a quick introduction of each of our panelists. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what NVU is, how the product works, and then we'll get into the questions. Uh, Grace, do you want to just go ahead and kick us off? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. My name is Grace Waltz. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy at the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Uh, we're a business advocacy organization. We represent 2,300 members across the 11 county metro area, and we engage in a wide range of policy issues from workforce to transit to housing, um, and then kind of take a two-prong approach, of course, thinking about things from a member's perspective, and that is in the sense of what our members are saying they need in order to have a successful and thriving business and also just what's best for our regional economy as a whole. So as the Vice President of Public Policy, I lead the Chamber's advocacy efforts at the federal, state, and local levels of government. So it's a nice mix for someone like me who came from a political campaign background because it gets to be still in the advocacy game and in the political realm, but it's a little more politics adjacent in, in my brain at least. So again, thanks so much for having us. Awesome, thank you. And Julia? Oh, I'm Julia Freeman. I'm the Director of Community Engagement for Voices for Racial Justice. Voices for Racial Justice, we believe in a world without racism. That knowledge, the knowledge and culture and all the gifts that uh, BIPOC communities have that bring to uh, uh, all this work with all the systems and everything and definitely bring to coalition work. So we do a lot of uh, convening and um, having uh, shared knowledge, opportunities for shared knowledge and co-creation of many things. So we, as an organization, sits as core members of many coalitions that we have helped build. And we're in the process of building a coalition right now called Racism as a Public Health Crisis. And I'll talk more about that later. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and so, like I said earlier, my name is Wintana and I'm a customer solutions manager here at Civic Eagle. And what Civic Eagle is, is that it's a company founded a few years ago that wanted to make democracy as accessible as possible. And so they started reaching out to folks in their community, trying to figure out what tools were needed. And after we got a lot of feedback from multiple organizations, company, individuals, and activists, what we realized is what we needed was a legislative tracking tool and not one that was weird and wonky and hard to use, but something that was very intuitive, interactive. And so that's how we built Enview. And what interview does is it helps you track this. It helps you discover, track, navigate, um, share and produce policy. And so what we've done is created a tool that is available to everyone through our um, through Open States, a nonprofit product that we recently acquired, and also the premium version of that, which is Envy, which allows you to, like I said, track every policy. And when I say every policy, I literally mean every policy. We cover all 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico, and federally. Uh, but that's enough about us. I don't want to be commercially, but um, we're actually going to get into the, the, the bulk of the conversation, which is really about how to build a coalition. What we all know is that no policy is passed alone. No individual institution, organization, or person can pass a bill by themselves, not even a senator. And so what we're going to talk about is who do you build with? How do you build? What happened when the pandemic started? And what did that change about you? And so just to jump right into that, I'm going to actually get into our first question, which is, uh, what's the first thing you noticed about building a coalition and how it was different during the pandemic? 
we know everything changed and a lot of us were stuck indoors and that meant we couldn't have those one-to-one -one conversations. You, you couldn't corner a state rep and you couldn't go to the farmer's market and, and you know, grab signatures and things like that or grab coffee with your local senator. And so I would just love to hear, like, what was the first thing you noticed about what was going to change and what were the things you did to be uh, prepared for that? And let's kick it off with uh, Julia this time. So very first thing you notice is you can no longer be together. And a lot of coalition building is based on relationships and sharing space together, right? So that couldn't happen, right? So that's just a, a normal thing. Then you had to be to um, really realize how do you still bring that same energy, you know, um, and the same uh, passion to the coalition work around the policies you're trying to move at the state and also locally, right? In co coalition building. So we had to get creative to really figure out one one thing, a lot of us were not familiar with the technology. Mm -hmm. So all the different platforms of how to you know engage. And so we had to figure out which one would work best for us, which one had the most uh, security, right? Because safety was an issue about being online for, especially when you're, you're dealing with BIPOC communities. So that was, that was a big shift right there. So we had to shift our way of engaging and shift our way on around action. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but action. And when you just said, Quintana, around collecting signatures, that had to be electronic, right? And um, even testimony had to be. So figuring all that out, and it, it was very important of how we can take the plan that we used to do all that in, in, in space together, how we could create, could create an environment that was an online in space that had the same beautiful shared opportunities to share knowledge and have passion. Awesome, thank you. Um, Grace? So I actually started at the Minneapolis Regional Chamber in July of 2020. So I only know this role in the context of a pandemic. Um, so over the course <laughs> of kind of those first five, six months um, on the job, I kind of had to simultaneously figure out first how to meet all the people I needed to meet, which you have to be a lot more intentional about because you don't have natural occasions like events or just being out and about where you run into people. And then also at the same time assessing who are going to be the right people to plug into the efforts that we knew we would be engaging in, particularly once the legislative session started. So I feel like the first thing I noticed is just it's very hard. It's time consuming and you have to be really intentional and particularly for an organization like the Chamber where networking events are our bread and butter, essentially, we needed to find new ways to connect with and motivate people. And at the same time, we were and in many ways continue to be in the midst of a global pandemic that's been completely devastating for virtually every sector of our economy and just for human beings generally. So those first several months and really still now continue to be this balancing act of wanting to continue to build these broad coalitions while also still recognizing that most businesses were just trying to figure out a way to stay afloat and keep their employees safe and keep their families safe. So for us, that meant just showing up in the ways that we needed to show up early on and throughout the pandemic. So we were really supportive of the statewide mask mandate and we're part of that distribution effort. And we worked with Hennepin County to stand up a program that got free technical assistance to businesses in the form of really anything they needed in order to keep their businesses going. Um, so it was a lot of shifting. I, had, I started the interview process for this job in March of 2020 wow. before I ended up doing another job in between. And the job that I thought I was interviewing for <laughs> looked a lot different uh, to the job that I actually started when I came on. Wow, that that's really impressive. Everything that you guys experienced, and we're still able to build power and pass these policies. I know for me, a week before the pandemic started or the shutdown started, I was at a large networking event. I was literally at the airport with like a box full of business cards that I had collected. Came home that that week, and that Monday, everything was shut down. And so I really appreciate hearing of the ways that you guys kept community and kept relationships and didn't just decide, you know, it is what it is. And so really appreciate the way you guys were uh, serving your bases. Um, so transitioning into our next question, which is tied to the first, it's what skills and tactics were you using before the pandemic that you miss 
And then I'm also going to add what skills and tactics from beforehand were you using now? Like what were you able to like pull over, maybe adjust? Were there any new tools or meeting tactics? Like how were you getting people to actually show up to things? And so what did you use before that you missed? And then what what did you start using that were, uh, was able to be really helpful to you? Um, and then I think, uh, Julia, if you want to go ahead. Well, you know, when Tyler, this is a very interesting question because we all said what we miss the most is actually being in community with one another. You know, with, with, which I'm sure everyone knows about uh, when you're building coalition work, it's definitely relationships, but people love to come together around breaking bread, right? Mm -hmm. Having food and conversation and being able to, to break out into small groups and all of that, even though we do some of that now electronically, you know, I, I kind of miss the, the flip chart paper and, and, you know, just putting the ideas up, you know, we got jam boards now, you know, electronically, you know, that you can do that and boost sticky, but, the, but that's, um, that's not the same of actually being together. So we make do with those tools that we have, but those bread and butter tools, those organic tools as, uh, as an organizer and bringing people together is uh, a tangible. It's the stuff that people can like walk away with uh, some things. And it's, it's a little different. Um, you can't do it as long as you could keep people in a, a space longer than you can keep people electronically because yeah. you know you lose people right so you can't yep. have you know a half a day you know retreat which we've done in in uh coalition we just i just had a retreat last week actually um where we were we were uh, it was all day retreat but you have to be tools are there's breaks and then there's food that's ordered and all that kind of stuff so there is uh the tools you had the tools had to be converted, even um, activities mm -hmm. that you would do in person. You, you can't do those activities the same online, right? And and even going over policies and you know thinking about uh, the different policies and making the changes and stuff is different even online than it is when you're like in person. So you have to change all of that. That makes sense. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense, especially that part about sending food. I, I, that's a requirement. Please <laughs> go over streets that don't send me lunch. Um, great. Uh, what are yeah? What are some of the things that you missed that you've brought in? Found ways to integrate or just new tactics that you've been using to build a bigger tent. Yeah, I mean, I really echo everything Julia said, again, particularly about the food, because <laughs> having a glass of wine or dinner with someone over a Zoom screen is not the same as being in the same room. And you miss that, you know, particularly we are accustomed to hosting, you know, bigger events um, and you can't have that mingling that you would usually have before or after event, which in a lot of ways is the point of the event. Um, and you just can't have that in a virtual space. Um, but, and at the end of the day, I think, you know, building coalitions, like we've all said, it's just about connecting with people. And that was still the case during the pandemic. We just had to do it through a screen. Um, and I think the role of a chamber can mean a lot of different things for people. And we see one of our main roles as being a convener and that didn't change during the pandemic. We just had to do it in different ways. And I think we leaned um, in the absence of being able to do things together and in person and mingle, we really leaned into the education aspect of what we do. So when you can't have an event where you can mingle, you may as well plan a bunch of different events where you can be informing your members or whoever wants to tune in about specific issues. And we were able to bring in really engaging speakers that we maybe wouldn't have been able to if we had to do events or if we were able to do events in person. Um, and I think one of the other things that we knew before and are continuing to carry into the world that we live in now is just being nimble. So like everything we planned for 2020 went out the window and we just had to respond to what the immediate needs were. And I think the whole year in a sense was basically an exercise in crisis management in a lot of ways. And I think what one of the things we learned is people really respond best and want to continue to work with you when you show up in the ways that you need to show up and are willing to pivot and try things outside your swim lane when you need to. Absolutely. I, I mean, pivot, nimble, those are, that's the word of this. Uh, <laughs> you know, I almost didn't want to say it. <laughs> 
I know, pivot. That's, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's the slogan. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for all of your 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 brilliant intel. Uh, so this is my obviously my favorite question because I love to win. Um, but what are your some some of your favorite policy wins that you that you were able to win? Through um, through your new coalition styles, you know policy wins during a pandemic. Uh, what were some of those? And and before I jump into that, I just want to share my own. Um, as someone who's very passionate about voting rights, we're really lucky where we have a really great coalition of folks from across the country that use our tool. And what one thing that I was able to do, I didn't personally have a policy win this year um, as a retired organizer, but I was able to actually use NView to track voting rights laws all across the country. So I was able to track Minnesota, get some funding for its electoral system, was able to watch some states beat back some really terrible policies. And so those are some of the wins that I got to watch other coalitions build by, by using NVIEW. And so I just wanted to hear like, what were your wins? Like, what were you successful at doing? Even though, you know, it was uh, the most traumatizing session of history. So tell me about it, you know, at city hall or in the streets or, um, what, what were you able to win through your coalitions during all of this? Um, and then Julia, if you want to go ahead. Oh yeah. So the, um, coalition to the increased teachers of color and American Indian teachers, right. We, we did get so much more funding to, for this, right. We did got more for grow your own and, um, lots of more money, um, out to districts, um, to actually do this, but the policies that were going to actually move the needle yeah. we didn't get right so so um and it's the same with um um like the solutions not suspension uh stuff like we wanted uh previous we got no pre-k to k students being uh pushed out with um ex uh, uh, um suspensions and expulsions and we were going for uh k to just third grade <laughs> this year yeah. and we 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 did not get it but we went so far and it was included in the omnibus bill and as you know so so many different things happen and so we're on that solutions and not suspension um as well as one of our policy and then um a lot of uh um the um ethnic studies coalition mm -hmm. also um, did get with uh, MDE and the policies, did get them to make some changes with the social studies. Um, and that was a win, but it still didn't go far enough. So it's hard to call it a win when it didn't go all the way there. So we call it a missed opportunities. And we so Voices hosted a missed opportunity mm -hmm. um, press conference with all of our um, partners that we are in coalition uh, with. We did... Uh, uh, our ethnic, um, was it a um, racial equity and joy coalition that we also uh, sit on that really looked at the budgets, right, and and the different things, and and um, so we didn't get far enough for that. And then, uh, and not to talk about the negative because you're talking about wins. What this is, what this does is it builds up for a missed opportunity for next year, like the racial equity impact notes, so that they can look at all of the the um, when legislators do just like a environmental impact assessments, right, and whatnot, they can look at the what the racial equity impact assessment note is like a fiscal note. You have a equity note, right? So the working group didn't happen, right? But it's a building. It's a, it's going to become a build. It's a building year for next year. So we already know what we want to do as a coalition going forward. Um, so yeah. And I just want to make sure, I just want to let you know, so Grow Your Own was one of the first policies that I advocated for as a young activist. And that was actually under the leadership of Voices. And mm -hmm. um, I watched the Minneapolis public school system fund it because of all the brilliant work you guys have been doing. And I've been watching that program grow every year. I've got a friend that's actually in the teacher, uh, the teacher program right now at the U. I've had multiple friends that have graduated and now they're in our public schools because of all the great work you've been doing. So just let you know, like your work is appreciated. We don't win all of them, but you've definitely had an impact on our students. So thank you for that. Um, and yeah, Grace, let us know, like, what did you guys win? Like, I know the chamber, I saw you guys doing really great work for some small businesses. Um, so yeah, would love to hear about that. 
Yeah, I think one of the things that we're most proud of was securing disaster relief funds for Twin Cities businesses that were impacted in the civil unrest last summer. And that was our number one priority going into session. And frankly, it was deeply frustrating that it took all the way to the end of session to get something passed and the funding allocated doesn't go nearly far enough. But you know, like, like uh, Julia was saying, you don't always get the win that you want and you just have to keep pushing. Um, we also got to partner with some of our members and other local chambers to help push for uh, tax increment financing flexibility, um, which isn't the most like sexy policy thing, but it's gonna be super helpful for um, a lot of the recovery in our hospitality industry. Um, and I think, again, you know, like an important part of coalition building is knowing where you can be an important partner in things, even if you aren't necessarily leading the charge. And I think one of those instances for us that we were really proud of was when Youth Prize reached out and asked us to partner with them on pushing for high school age students to be eligible for unemployment insurance. Mm -hmm. And I think that is somewhere where we were kind of an unusual partner in that coalition. But to us, it was just a basic issue of fairness and also a workforce issue. We knew money was already getting paid into the system on behalf of these kids. And we also knew that the kids that would really benefit from this policy change were the ones who weren't just working to earn extra spending money. They were working to help put food on the table for their family, support parents who might have been laid off, save money for college or a car or just generally pay for expenses that if you're not fortunate enough to have a parent cover those for you, you have to cover for yourself. Um, so those were, I think those were some of the high points. You know, it was like Quintana said, it was a weird session. So you kind of just took any wins <laughs> while you could. Um, and there's always next year. Absolutely, absolutely. I know all three of us have sat in similar coalitions, driver's license for all and, yeah. and things like that. And, and we know you know, you use every year to build a bigger tent. You use every year to build a stronger coalition. You know, you don't always win, but you make sure it's never a full loss and you're continuously doing the things you can do to, to build for your base. So I appreciate all the brilliant things y'all do and, and you know, the wins that you brought to the Twin Cities and, and beyond. Um, next thing I wanted to talk about is technology. So we all went from maybe a Google calendar, a Slack message here and there to like, now I have three monitors and a web camera and every tech toy that could have ever walked the earth. I would love to hear like, what new technology were you using? What has been your saving grace? Um, what do you use to keep your coalitions together? Like, what are the fun things you're doing during meetings that you've been using to integrate um technology one really cool thing about nview is that we're always looking to add new partners so we we're building a relationship right now with every action and email service that lots of folks use and we want to integrate it into our tool and we're working with a lot of other types of organizations to figure out how do we better improve our technology and get things to better communicate because even if we go back to post pandemic life some things are just never going to change. And there have been so many benefits and, and upgrades to technology. So we'd love to hear like what technologies were you guys using that were really helping you to elevate your coalition building? And then uh, let's actually, Grace, you want to go first this time? We'll, we'll shake it up. Sure. Um, so given the geographic scope of the chamber, even without the pandemic, our staff doesn't typically work in the same place. So the other half of our public policy public policy team and I don't actually work in the same building and we probably won't even like when we're back to work full time. I work downtown um, and he works at our office building in St. Louis Park. So a tool like Envue is great because with or without remote work, we were able to work together in kind of that shared space. And obviously it made tracking legislation incredibly easy. I would, could look things up really quickly just by typing a few words in a pinch, which was really helpful when you're multitasking during a meeting. Um, and it also made things really easy for us to pull together an end of session message for our members, which is something Wintana walked me through how to do a couple weeks before session ended. Um, so we were able to give a really comprehensive summary of the different pieces of legislation that we worked on. And then I think, of course, like everyone else, we shifted all of our programming online, which like I've said in some ways was unfortunate because you miss out on the in-person interactions. But I think in a lot of ways was actually really awesome because it made them more accessible and you don't have to factor in travel time for a virtual event. And I'm not ashamed to admit that I tuned in to most of our early morning events from my bed. And we also posted recordings of all of our events on our YouTube channel. So I think we were able to reach a much wider audience than we otherwise would have. 
Uh, but oddly enough, in a lot of ways, I think we use technology in the same way that we would have regardless of a pandemic. Like a lot of that bread and butter advocacy work is it's just sending letters, it's action alerts, it's just picking up the phone and making a call. All of those things are critical components that you can do really regardless of where you're working. Awesome, thank you. And I'll just, you know, shameless plug, cause, cause you mentioned it. Uh, and you has a really great tool called Public Tags. So we actually give you a, a product that a lot of our competitors don't have, which gives you the ability to actually post a public policy agenda. You can do it by issue area, by geography. You can put an alert telling people to call a senator. Um, and it just comes automatically with the tool. The tool has no seat limits. It's also completely public and available to anyone you email to, press, senators, leaders. So if you're interested in learning more about that, just you know hit us up in the comments. Well, also, let me add, if you do have questions, we're on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook Live. Go ahead and drop those comments. We'll be taking those questions at the end. Um, and yes, Julia, I would love to hear, like, what technology did you guys add or and how did it just make things a little bit easier? So I would say definitely it was not me because technology is not my friend. I'm glad that we have others who are very more technology knowledgeable than myself. So we've used, um, of course, Zoom. Right, we've used Zoom, and there's so much more that you can do with Zoom. Um, the other technology is uh, Microsoft Teams. Right, um, we've used that. We've used with the with the uh, coalition. We also have something called Whereby, is another one, and these are all the ones that you can have uh, their safety around uh, yeah. technology. Also, we've used uh, GroupMe and uh, Telegram. Right. Um, for uh, uh, communication with, because those are safe. Um, it's, it's very important for uh, communities of color to feel safe with things that are that are happening. We um, um, always uh, the action the action alerts are really big, right? So um, and how we engage community and having elect having clear uh, um, action alerts of what they can do even at the end of meetings, having action items, right? So being able to use those many different tools as well. And so I'm not sure if, I think one of the organizations do use the tool you just talked about, mm -hmm. but I haven't personally used it. The other yeah. people take care of those communications. <laughs> yes, it's usually Brett at Voices that I'm yeah. uh, chatting <laughs> with about, about NVU. Um, exactly. you know, there's a question I didn't write down, but I actually, uh, I think I'm gonna pivot to Grace if you wanna talk about this, but I think security became even more of a question, especially after the last year we had in Minneapolis. Um, and so I would love to hear like, what have you been hearing from small businesses around safety and technology and coalitions? Like, what are they doing to, to, to keep their data online safe? Yeah, I mean, I think this was a big component. I mentioned earlier this partnership that we have with Hennepin County to launch. Um, it's called um, uh, Elevate Business, which it still exists. Um, it's still up and running. Um, and one of, I shouldn't necessarily speak out of turn because I'm not entirely sure which TA providers are still in the service at this point. But one of the services that were offered early on was uh, folks who would help businesses transition their business models online, whether it was restaurants or retailers or really kind of it ran the gamut um, and connected you with a lot of different kind of services. So I think that's kind of the space that we stepped into is we knew that basically every single business was trying to shift online or virtually in some way and of course everyone wanted to make sure that they were doing it safely so we tried to find ways to make sure that folks were able to do that um not just in an easy way for them but also at a no cost way to them because that's the last thing i think particularly small businesses needed in the past year was to have to spend all this extra money mm -hmm. making changes to their business model that they certainly did not ask to have to make yeah, I know for me, I spent a lot of time this uh, last summer funneling a lot of immigrant small businesses to the BTAP program uh, in the city of Minneapolis. So I appreciate all the work you guys did to, to help get those businesses online. Um, and now we're going to get to our last question. And that is, uh, what will you keep doing post pandemic that helped change your mindset around building policy? I think all of us before were like, 
you know, our meetings had to be in person and in person only. Like you had to be at the Capitol 24 seven, even if it was midnight, there was just driving from meeting to meeting, um, you know, not using technology enough, not live streaming everything to make it accessible. And so like, what are the things that you're gonna do no matter what post pandemic to help you build a bigger coalition, to bring more people into the tent and to help you just pass better policy? And um, Julia, if you wanna kick us off. Well, one thing the pandemic has showed us is the access to people being able to be more involved and more engaged because of Zoom, right? So they didn't have to get in their car and they didn't have to physically drive. They, we didn't have to provide food and we didn't have to provide daycare, which we mm -hmm. missed that part that I said earlier at the beginning. So we're going to do a hybrid, right? It's, it's, it's a both and for those who can make it having that other option of keeping a hybrid of how people are staying engaged is something mm -hmm. we'll keep for our coalition work. The other piece is using technology to actually get people up and uh, running around testimony and, and knowledge around policy, right? Mm -hmm. So the technology piece also helps that. And you want to still do that also in person. Once again, more of a hybrid you know, model. So keeping a lot of the technology um, that we had to do, right, mm -hmm. did make things... Um, easier and increased engagement, right? Because people didn't have to drive or run and get the kids dinner in the car. You know, it was just some things that were just a little different. And so we want to keep that and make those adjustments as we need to. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Grace? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the blessings and curses of virtual work is it allows you to pack your schedule in ways that are just impossible mm -hmm. when you factor in travel time. And the MRC policy team is three people and we cover a wide geography. Um, so just basic scheduling is something that I've thought a lot about as we think about committee hearings coming back to being in person. And obviously there's a huge value in doing a lot of that stuff in person. Um, like we've said, particularly when you think about conversations that you're able to have in the hall or whatever it is. Um, but I do hope that we retain the option of virtual hearings because I think it opened up the door for so many more people to participate in the policymaking process that otherwise wouldn't have or couldn't have um, if they had to trek to the Capitol or their local city hall or whatever it is. Um, and I personally, I know I really appreciated being able to multitask where I waited for that 90 seconds <laughs> that you testify in a hearing. Um, but I think with this being my first year at the chamber, basically everything in the last year was a learning opportunity just by nature of being new. And we're also at this exciting point for MRC as we're in the midst of launching a new strategic direction. We merged with Twin West, which was another regional chamber um, almost a year ago. So this past year has been a lot of just internal planning, um, internal strategic planning. And from an advocacy perspective, it's kind of just figuring out how do we take everything we've been doing both virtually and in person and just do it better? So establishing a really strong feedback loop with our members, making sure that they understand what we're working on from a policy perspective. And again, just being that educational resource and using all the tools in our arsenal, whether it's programming both virtual and in person or like policy white papers that you can publish uh, that give just a really basic analysis um, of an issue and I think at the end of the day, just making sure that we're listening to our members because we are a membership organization. And part of what makes us unique is our really vast and diverse membership. And part of that coalition building power comes from those members and making sure that we are leveraging their expertise and relationships and storytelling abilities to really push good policy. I just wanted to add, Montana, if I could, that it also allowed us to bring in more rule Minnesotans into the policy making process, right? And also youth. Yep. Because you with the technology. So those things we'll keep. <laughs> um, I know for me, capital, one thing that, that I don't miss is, you know, the aide comes out and only has 10 copies of an amendment and everyone's trying to get a copy and you're taking photos and sharing that inaccessibility shouldn't have existed before the pandemic. And like both of you said, I really hope it continues. I think that we've 
you know, always done a disservice by not creating enough access for our rural leaders and young people to, to participate in democracy. Um, and I think, you know, that's NVU's entire, that's Civic, NVU by Civic Eagle's entire purpose is to just make democracy as accessible as possible. Um, and I think this is a great time to actually, um, let's close out. So if you guys just want to share, you know, maybe a little bit about you, your organization, maybe some next steps people can take or how to get plugged in. So or maybe you have a, a, an event uh, coming up. And so, um, Julia, if you want to just kick us off with um, anything you want to share with uh, folks listening, we had about 50 folks sign up, YouTube, Facebook Live, all of that. Then we record and we post this on our website. So what do you want to fo let folks know? That um, Voices for Racial Justice sits on core teams of many coalitions that we help build the strategy policies for, both uh, local and also state policies. And this, um, we're always looking for new uh, people who want to be engaged. So the uh, coalition to uh, increase teachers of color and American Indian teachers, there is, uh, uh, we just finished the summer gathering, but we're going to be doing some kind of gather gathering in the fall. We're in the process of having a retreat on the 10th and 11th, and that'll be coming out soon. So look for that. Um, the Solutions Not Suspension Coalition, which it deals with the um, push out of, of, of kids, right? Please get involved in that. We meet monthly. Um, look for us on your website. And then Advancing Equity Coalition, we're in Minneapolis, but we are really shaping not only the teachers of color, to increase teachers of color in that district, but also all kinds of other work that has to do with equity. So get involved. You know, we're looking for more parents and more youth. And so, as you know, as most of you might know or might not know, um, Voices for Racial Justice has always been a policy leader with a racial equity lens. And so we're continuing to do that around our quilt. Our quilt, we have a quilt magazine and we'll be doing that on the uh, bi biennium um, basis. So one will be coming out the, 20, the 2022 and 2023 uh, session. And um, we have a podcast as well, the quilt podcast, and also a website called the quilt. And this is where um, all policy is more, like what we like to call life giving, where it had it features um, BIPOC communities, not only their gifts, their talents, but also art and culture is highlighted as it relates to policy. Awesome, thank you. Um, Grace? Uh, well, I suppose I should start considering that we're a membership organization, that if you are a business owner in the Levin County metro region and you are not a Minneapolis Regional Chamber member, we would certainly love to have you and be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, really great events coming up. Again, the benefits of doing things virtually is I was able to pull up our calendar as Julia was talking. Um, we have a great event coming up, uh, kind of digging into some of the changes we've seen in Hennepin County that was outlined in the recent census data and just how much the county has grown over the last 10 years. Um, also, it's election season, which I don't think is going to be news to anyone, but we are partnering with League of Women Voters uh, to sponsor some candidate forums, both in Minneapolis um, and in um, cities around the rest of our footprint. Um, and we're also hosting an event that's going to dig into ranked choice voting because obviously Minneapolis has had ranked choice voting for a few years now, but there are a few cities in our footprint that are um, using it for the first time this year. Um, but we are big fans of, you know, working with unusual partners and particularly when it comes to public private partnerships. So we're always a uh, open ear if folks are looking to get involved. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and before we wrap up, I just want to remind folks, my name is Lantana. I'm a customer solutions manager here at Enview by Civic Eagle. And if you want to get plugged into our work, feel free to just visit civiceagle.com. And up in the top right corner, there's actually a button where you can sign up for a free trial. And so you'll then get an email alert from me and I will get you onboarded. I'll get you set up. If you have questions about pricing or how to use the tool or any of that really cool stuff, just go ahead and visit our website, which is civiceagle.com. And I just want to say thank you to our two guests. Thank you for sharing your brilliance. Thank you for all the work you do in the Twin Cities and beyond to just 
make our state as great as it is. I know there's so much work that Minnesota has to do, uh, but I feel like with folks like y'all, we're getting closer to solving some of these problems every day. So um, thank you everyone. And everyone can find a copy of this on our LinkedIn, YouTube, um, and Facebook coming soon. So have a great day.